Income tax 2023-2024. Other adjustments to income tax software example. Get ready and some coffee because although the best things in life are free, you know that eventually the government will find a way to tax them, which means we have to be ready with income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But, but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our, trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant. Because apparently we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Here we are in our form 1040 example problem using Lacert tax software. You don't need tax software to follow along, but if you have access to tax software, it's a great tool to run scenarios with. You can also get access to forms, schedules, instructions at the IRS website, irs.gov, irs.gov. Looking at our standard starting point where we have Adam Taxman just trying to avoid a dang tax man. Living in Beverly Hills, 90210, single filer, W-2 income starting at the 100000 We've got the standard deduction, 13850 getting to the taxable income, 86150 We can mirror that in our income tax formula in Excel, 100000 13850 86150 taxable income, then the tax calculated at the 14266 which we can see on page 2 of the form 1040. All right, let's go back to our first page. Let's look at our point of focus this time, which is on line 10, adjustments to income from Schedule 1. Let's look at the Schedule 1, which is the additional income and adjustments. We want to see page 2, which is also part 2, the adjustments to income. We're down here on lines 24. So you can see line 24 being called other adjustments mean that these are probably not the items that are going to be most commonly used. However, they are used from time to time, and some of these other items have their own individual line items from A down to Z, and we can see that Z, of course, is where we might put the items that don't have any other line item applied to them. Okay, so then let's start off with the first one where we have the jury duty. Where, where was it? There it is. 24A. So we have a, a jury duty situation. Now in a jury duty, you're going to get income. And we saw that on the income line up top. So we'd say, okay, well, what happens if you had a jury duty situation and you had income from it, but you're already getting paid by your employer, for example. And, uh, and because the employer is paying you your normal salary while you're at jury duty, they say that they want you to give them the jury duty pay right because otherwise you're getting paid twice you know for the same thing so if that was the case you might get a 1099 for jury duty pay which means you'd have to include it here and so we'd go okay jury duty let's imagine it was a thousand dollars and i'm going to go back on over and say say then that we have the thousand dollars that would pull into page uh one of the form 1040 there's a thousand but then we're saying hey wait a second I shouldn't have to pay for that thousand dollars because I had to give it to my employer because they're already still paying my salary would be the scenario. Why don't I just remove this one thousand and not include it? Well, I can't do that. Why? Because the jury duty might have given a 1099 to the government. And if I don't include it on my taxes, then the government's going to say that you got money from jury duty that you didn't report. So how can we get to the same point so we have the income at the same place or at least the adjusted income well we can also go to the schedule one page number two and say i'm just going to take it back out here jumping to the jury duty and so now we're going to say boom 100 or 1000 uh, i should say so now if i go back on over we could see it, it went out here so it went in on page one as income and then we took it back out 
and that's going to show up on the first page of the form 1040 increasing income to 101,000 but then we reduced it again by a thousand getting us back to the starting point of 100,000 and back to our same basically uh, taxable income that we had over here this is a common technique that you want to keep in mind because the underlying foundational idea you want to have in mind is if I get a reporting document from somebody like a 1099 or W-2, I have to report it on my return generally. Otherwise, the IRS will almost surely cause me a problem because the people that gave me a 1099 or W-2 also gave it to the IRS. That's the important part. The IRS is trying to act like they're helping you out, but that's not what they're really doing. They're trying to get the person who is paying the money to rat the person who received the money out to the government with the form 1099. So if they have the form, then if it's wrong, what am I going to do about it? Well, I have to either get it fixed by the issuer of the 1099 if there was an error or and or in certain situations, I might be able to show the IRS what happened like we're doing here. Hey, look, IRS, there's the 1000. I put the 1099 information on here, but I shouldn't be taxed for it because I had to pay it back and therefore, I'm just going to remove it back out so you can see it for informational purposes, although it doesn't have an impact on the tax calculation. All right, next one. Let's go back on over to the Schedule 1 and remove that and say, okay, I see what's happening there. Let's get that out of here and get back to our starting point if we could. I won't do that in Excel because I don't want to think that's pretty straightforward. So we'll go back on over and say, okay, next one. What if, uh, let's look at 20, this one, deductible expenses related to income reported on line 8i from rental or personal property engaged in for profit. So now we have a situation, let's go to the first page where we say it was on uh, 8L, I'm sorry, I keep on saying I, 8L, because it's lowercase, income from the rental or personal property if you engaged in rental for profit, but were not in business of renting such property. Now, this one might not come up all that often, but I think it really is a good indication of what we have to keep in mind with regards to different types of income. In other words, if something comes in, we get a 1099 or something like that, and it's something that was subject to, to business income, meaning it's earned income, then, then we might have to put it on the Schedule C. Noting that if I put it on the Schedule C, I have an income statement but it will also be subject to uh, taxes possibly, right? So you wanna make sure that if, you, if you're dealing with the Schedule C, uh, you could have basically taxes related to the calculation. So let me just show you that. If I, if I was to say, okay, if it was an income, a self-employment type of situation, then it would be subject to self-employment tax. So if I had if I had income of, let's say we sold some 10,000 10, side job gig work, and then we had advertising of 7,000, then we have income of the 3,000, but notice all the other things that are affected here. It's not just that that 3,000 is gonna be included in income. We're also gonna have the self-employment tax. Uh, these are the estimated payments, hold on. Self-employment tax is here calculated so we have this impacted so that goes up to the form 1040 so now we have the added 3000 but we also have an impact for the adjustment because half of the self-employment tax is deducted we have this qualified business income deduction situation and page two we have this added tax for uh the self-employment okay so that means so you have to say well maybe i'm not subject to self-employment if in some types of income. So if I'm not subject to self-employment, then I don't want it on the Schedule C. The other thing would be, well, what if it was subject to capital gains similar to like selling stocks and bonds? Well, in that case, we saw that you, you could have favorable uh, tax rates. So if there was a disposition of something that we sold subject to capital gains, it was property that we sold and we sold it over a year old, we're going to say it's going to go from uh, 010100 to 013123, and we sold it for 10,000 and we bought it for 7,000. Notice then 
If I go back on over, now we have a Schedule D situation, long-term capital gain, which is rolling into the Form 1040. And so that rolls in and you're like, okay, that makes sense. But uh, if I go to page two, then that's going to be taxed possibly at favorable uh, tax rates because it's a long-term capital gain rather than ordinary income tax rates. So you have to think, okay, would that be the right place to put it? Because capital gains could have a significant impact if it's uh, subject to SAP capital gains because long-term capital gains could have a better tax rate and losses are going to be limited to, to the amount of income, right? And then, and then if it's not capital gain rates, I'm going to delete that and say, if it's not capital gain rates and it's not subject to self-employment, then you would think the income might go somewhere in the schedule one, right? So then I'd go, okay, it doesn't go there. It goes into the schedule one and we're looking for, in this case, income from rental or personal property, jumping to that. And we're going to say 10,000. And then if I jump that jump back on over that's going to be included and then the other side we're putting here and we're going to say do, 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 line number 24 deductible expenses related to income reported on line uh 8l i keep on saying i from the rental so if i right click and jump to that we're going to say that this is the uh seven thousand so now we have the income on on the schedule one the ten thousand and then the deductible expenses related to income reported on 8l from the rental personal property engaged uh, for profit that pulls into the 1040 so there we have it and uh the seven thousand then pulling in here let me check that again wait a second did i put i put seven thousand income uh, prior year to, to, yeah, that's right. Sorry about that. I've got the 100,000 plus the 10,000 brings me to 110,000 and then the 7,000. So the net of the 10 and the seven is 3000. So you can see the net change to our adjusted gross income is 103,000. And we still have the standard deduction of the 13,850 tax income at 89,150 page two calculating the tax but now we just have the normal progressive tax rates so so that probably is not going to come up that specific case might not come up that much but you might have situations where people get like a 1099 for something that's not really their business right and it might be some income you have to report and the question it comes up in terms of what category of income is it is it subject to self-employment tax is it subject to to favorable capital gains rates for capital gain income, or is it some other income that needs to be reported that isn't subject to self-employment tax and should be taxed at ordinary income rates, okay? All right, let's go back on over and check that out again. So I'm gonna go back and let's remove those. So that makes sense, hopefully. <laughs> I'll delete this and then go back on over and say, what's the next scenario? These are interesting scenarios right here. Uh, wait a second, page one. Okay, I've removed it now. Next one, we've got <clears throat> the non-taxable amount of the value of Olympic and Paralympic medals, USOC prize money reported on line 8M. So again, probably not one that you see often, but conceptually, I think it's useful to just take a look at so now we're going to say that we have the Olympic and Paralympic medals. So if you have a client that's a, that's a medal winner, then normally prizes are something that you're going to have to pay taxes on. And again, you might get a form for it, like a 1099 or something that shows you that amount, which the IRS has, and therefore you're going to have to record it in income. But there might be an exception for, for whether you have to include it in income for adjusted gross income, so what you wanted so what we're going to do there is include it once again here and then if i can exclude some of that income i'm going to report it in the non-taxable amount down here and that will net out in a similar way as we saw with the prior example 
I won't do it this time because we've seen it before and this is a less common example, but that's the general concept of it. And obviously we don't, we want to give our Olympic athletes the benefit of tax benefits as an incentive to win. We only ta we tax the losers. We ta okay, I'm not going to get into that again. But all right, let's go down to the to the last one here. Z is where the other adjustments are. So obviously, if you have some kind of income, remember the general rule from the IRS is everything is income unless there's an exception. So you can come up with a lot of different scenarios where you might have other cases of income that don't have their own line item, but which technically should be recorded in taxes. And then you could basically uh, include them down here. Now, we also have this scenario with these 1099 Ks, which remember the 1099s is a situation where the IRS is trying to get a stranglehold on the economy. And they'll probably be starting to choke out certain businesses like gig work, for example, which often consist of basically middle platforms that aren't really hiring people like a contractor or an employee they're really connecting two people together usually small businesses so a lot of the gig work platforms one person's going on it to provide a good or service and another person is being able to find them because of the platform and the platform is really just kind of like the silk road the trading path that allows the two people to get together well the iris is going to have limited capability to tell the person who's going to issue the 1099. Is it the person who's getting the job through the platform, which would be very detrimental to the to the to the functioning of the platform because you'd have small businesses subject to these 1099 rules through the platform? Or is it the platform itself, which is detrimental to the platform because it's supposed to it's just really acting as a connecting tool or they can go after the the PayPal's of the world, the financial institutions that are facilitating the transactions. So, so as they try to hit these different people to try to strangle hold on, on the, on the, the taxes, then sometimes you might get like two K ones or schedule K ones or something, uh, or 1099s, one from the financial institution possibly, and one from the platform or one from the other one you're doing business with. And you have to correct that, hopefully going back to whoever issued it to you to tell them to fix it. But if you can't get it fixed, then you have to, again, deal with the idea that you might have to report it to show it to the IRS and show that there was an error in it or something like that. So we have an, one, an example also that looks kind of like this that they have in the instructions. On line 24Z, uh, you would enter $700 and in the entry space next to line 24Z, you would write form 1099k personal items sold at a loss. So, so we have the situation in the entry space next to line 24, write uh, form 1099k sold at a loss and also enter the amount for the sales proceeds. So for example, you bought a couch for $1,000, sold it through a third party vendor uh, for $700, which was reported on your form 1099. So now you have a 1099 for 700. Again, the questions are, is that something that should be reported subject to self-employment tax, Schedule C, or subject to capital gains, Schedule D, or possibly over here, not capital gains and not self-employment tax and on the other section. So we have the same scenario with two other calculations where we might say, all right, well, that means I have other income from uh, the sale. So we could say, do and I'm going to say other, and we had a sale, uh, sale of couch at a loss or something like that. And we got the proceeds of $700. And so I'm going to pull that on over and say, there's uh, the 700 on the income side. And then we're going to have to go back on over here and say it was sold at a loss though. So I'm going to basically pull it back out on this side, jumping over and saying something like it was 700. It was a, and we say form 1099K, that's not a K, K, personal item sold at a loss. And then I'm going to put the loss up to just the $700 so it matches what's on the other side. So if I go back on over 
and we're so we're just taking the loss up to basically the income amount because we because it was a personal item sold that's the general idea so once again we have the seven hundred dollars of income and then on page two we're taking it back out same concept here so that if i go to the first page of the 1040 100,000 700 has been included telling the irs hey look there it is you got a 1099 for this but possibly it shouldn't be included in, in income because i sold it at a loss and i'm just going to put the amount up to the loss to to remove it so that i'm back down to just my standard uh 100,000 dollars again so similar kind of concepts that we've seen here being mindful of the reporting of the 1099s that are not only going to us but are going to the irs as well now we have a similar kind of remedy that you might put in place if you had an incorrect 1099 right so let's say the 1099 was just flat wrong you got 700 dollars. you shouldn't why because they, maybe you got two 1099s because two people issued you the 1099 one was the financial institution one was the gig work platform or something like that well then we're gonna once again we could try to go to the issuer of the 1099 and say hey you need to fix this because the irs is going to think that i got double my income because two people issued me the 1099 but sometimes that can be difficult to do uh, so the other option would be to say hey look irs here's the 700 i got and in the statement you would say something like it's an incorrect 1099 over here and then on the second uh page or the adjustment we would put here that we have an above the line adjustment or adjustment to income once again telling the irs hey look this is me negating the income i put up top just to show you that thing that matches your 1099 was incorrect here's my rationale for it so the irs has the audit trail in essence of it going in on line eight and then back out bringing us back to the uh 100 000. so so one of the main takeaways of this uh this whole section is that these things might not come up all that often hopefully they don't where you have an an error in the 1099 you probably don't have that many olympic athletes or whatnot but you but it emphasizes the fact that i think could come up in in scenarios and at least with discussions with clients about documentation and how you're going to basically need to communicate with the irs to cause as little friction as possible to communicate well so that the tax returns don't get you know delayed and whatnot in the refunds and that's basically going to be able to recognize what the iris has they have the 1099s and whatnot so you have to communicate with them in a in a way to recognize the information that they have and what they don't have they don't know the information was incorrect or anything like that so so you're going to have to deal with either fixing the 1099 or trying to find some way to show the irs and match what they have on their side and then correct it so that they can see the audit trail of that correction